Greetings from Envika. Thanks for joining today's wildlife webinar session. The webinar is moderated by Kiran Bagade and myself. We have with us odonate expert Mr. Vivek Chandran from uh, Thrissur district Kerala uh, has contributed immensely to the field of ornithology in the state of Kerala for more than 10 years. Let me start with a small introduction of him. Uh, Vivek has done post graduation in ecology and environment. He is currently a PhD scholar in the Department of Geology and Environmental Science, Christ College, Thrissur, which is under Calicut University. His research topic is diversity and ecology of odonates in Kole wetland, Central Kerala, India. He has various publications uh, in his name and also a lot of uh, books that he has published. His other few of uh, achievements include, he is a winner of first C. Achutamenan T.R. Chandra Datta Dutt Fellowship instituted by Center of Science and Technology for Rural Development, COSTFRD. On the theme environment and the topic was Odoni diversity of Kole wetlands, Kerala. He is also the winner of idea and for research on the topic diversity and ecology of Odonis in Kole wetlands, Central Kerala. This was just a small introduction of the award. We are very uh, glad that you are with us. Over to you. Thank you. So thank you team for this uh, great opportunity because I never lose an opportunity to talk about ordinates because they are so close to my heart. I started out as a bird watcher some uh, 15 years ago and then suddenly uh, started getting interested in dragonflies just a few years ago, some three years ago. Uh, you know, I worked in various fields. I worked for the government. I worked in Food Corporation of India for a while. But then research was always close at hand. And when the opportunity came knocking, I just seized it. So, yeah, thank you once again for the opportunity. So, these are the helicopters of the ecosystem, the dragonflies. Uh, in most states in India, uh, they are known by uh, the name of uh, helicopters, mostly in their region language sometimes. Even in Kerala, some, uh, the large ordinates, uh, the large dragonflies are called uh, helicopters sometimes. So this, uh, to begin with, I'll just introduce you to some, something beautiful. I don't know if uh, any of you have seen this uh, species. This is the Myristica sapphire. Okay, this is a very charismatic species. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's very small. It's a very small insect. Uh, so so I don't know if it can be. If, uh, how many of you would agree with me that it is a charismatic species or not? Because when you speak of charismatic species, you usually have images of tigers, lions, or elephants in your mind. But uh, why is this species charismatic? Okay, does size matter or why is it char charismatic? I'll tell you why. So I don't know if you have heard of this uh, ecosystem called the Myristica swamps. These are small pockets in the Western Ghats of India. Uh, these are endemic habitats found nowhere else in the world. These are endangered. They're not found everywhere throughout the Western Ghats. They are only found in small pockets. And almost all the organisms found here, including the plants, animals, snakes, butterflies, birds, everything, almost all of them are endemic. And this uh, species, the Calocypha light larvae, can actually serve as a flagship species for this ecosystem because it occurs only in this particular ecosystem and the associated habitats. Okay, so this is a very beautiful species. It is rare, it is endemic, and it is, it is very rare to find this beauty. So this is the male, as in most species in dragonflies also, the males are the ones which are very showy and colorful. Okay, this is the female. And there is another interesting detail about this species. The female was unknown, okay, by the time, uh, after when Fraser described it in the 1930s, Fraser is the British um, scientist, he was a British uh, army officer actually, he's the one who studied in detail about Indian ordinates, okay, so even now we refer to his books of 1930s to uh, know more about, uh, to confirm identities of uh, many ordinates, okay, so after his description, original description, uh, this species was unknown, at least the female was unknown. Okay, just a few years back, this photograph was taken. This is the, probably the first photograph of this insect uh, from the world. Okay, this was just taken a few years back. So the, even, this, uh, even though this is a charismatic, very beautiful species, uh, the female remained unknown for all these years, almost 90 years, can you imagine? So uh, it points to the fact that we are not paying much attention to these automates, okay? Uh, despite the fact that uh, ornates are one of the most uh, easiest insects to study, you know, because I'll tell you why as we pro proceed. Okay, but we need to know what uh, ordinate is, right? I keep saying ordinata because uh, they belong to the order ordinata. 
It includes both dragonflies and damselflies. They are usually uh, called uh, together as dragonflies. They are different actually. I'll tell you what the differences are. But first of all, we need to separate Odonata from the other insects. These are the closest relatives of um, Odonata. Okay, these are the ant lions and the owl flies. Okay, but they can easily be separated because none of the dragonflies or damselflies have such long antennae. See, the antennae are almost invisible here. Okay, they are just uh, tiny projections here. But they that is because they mostly uh, rely on their vision to detect prey and predators. So uh, the antennae are usually used for uh, chemo reception and uh, the uh, sense of touch. Okay, so that is not much used by the dragonflies. So it is not well developed. So by, just by looking at the long antennae, you can say these are ant lions and these are owl flies. Owl flies have even longer antennae and they're club shaped and their larvae uh, live uh, in vegetation. Okay, and ant lions, uh, their larvae live in the soil. You know, you, many of you would have seen the traps set by these uh, small insects. They are larvae of ant lion. Okay, they make pits and wait for their prey to come to them. So yeah, so they are animals, ordinates are animals, of course. And they are insects because they have three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings. And they are ordinata. They belong to the insect order ordinata because they have strong mandibles that act like teeth. You know, these are the first kind of mouth parts that evolved in evolution. Uh, the same is shared by our cockroaches. You know, cockroaches also bite and chew. So they have this uh, same kind of uh, mouth parts. So uh, the term ordinata come from odon odonto. You, you would have heard of odontology. Odontology is, is the study of teeth. So they have strong teeth. They're not really teeth, uh, kind of teeth that we have, but they're mandibles, okay? So they have biting and chewing mouth parts. They're predators, okay? So that is ordinata. And there are three main groups of ordinates. Okay, one is damselflies that belong to the order Psygoptera. This is a damselfly. And then we have dragonflies belonging to the suborder Anisoptera. And then we have something in between, Anisozygoptera. Let's see what it is, okay? I mean, just by looking at the pictures, you can tell the differences between a dragonfly and a damselfly. The superficial uh, differences are that uh, the dragonflies rest with their wings wide open and they have more robust bodies usually. Uh, but the damselflies uh, are more delicate. They are not strong flyers and they have uh, their wings folded and held parallel to their abdomen. Okay, so an the anisocygoptera, on the other hand, they are somewhere in between. They have stout bodies like the dragonflies, but their wings are held, uh, you know, closed and parallel to their abdomen, like the damselflies. Okay, so they come somewhere in between and they're a very interesting group because only four species exist in the world today. And we have only one species in India that is in the Eastern Himalayas. It's usually found in the Darjeeling Hills. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the Anisocygoptera and they have a very long larval lifespan because they spend six to nine years uh, in water. Okay, I hope all of you know that uh, the dragonflies and damselflies, they require water to breed. You know, they cannot, they cannot uh, survive without fresh water. They lay their eggs in water, their larvae develop in water, and then they emerge out. So uh, this guy, uh, this guy's larva, uh, they live for six to nine years inside water before it emerges out as a flying insect. So this is the Anisocygoptera. It is called a living fossil. Why? Why do we call an organism a living fossil? Because even if you dig up a fossil now, you may find something similar to this, very similar to this. The body structure and shape and uh, the features have not changed much. Okay, so it, it has survived as such because it was a, such a successful organism. So it has survived as such. Uh, so this is a relic organism, this is a living fossil. Okay, now we come to dragonflies and damselflies. To go more technical, uh, this is not the real difference, okay? We cannot say that all dragonflies uh, rest uh, with their wings open and all damselflies rest with their wings closed. That is not the real scientific uh, way of classifying um, Otternata into Anisoptera and Psygoptera. Okay, the dragonflies belong to uh, suborder Anisoptera and the damselflies belong to the suborder Psygoptera. That is, the classification is based on the size and shape of their wings. The term tero means wings, okay. Aniso means unequal. So the dragonflies have unequal wings, which means their hind wings are broader when compared to their fore wings. This is the real difference. But in the damselfly, the suborder Psygoptera, all the wings are of the same size and shape. Okay, that is the real difference. The other differences are superficial and they may, there may be exceptions. There may be exceptional cases. So this is the real difference. 
Okay, let's proceed. Even if it is the dragonfly or the damselfly, the body structure is almost the same. Okay, they all have a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, like any insect. Yeah, and there are uh, three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings on the thorax. Yes, and then we, they have a long uh, abdomen, long and thin abdomen uh, that are segmented. The abdomen is segmented into 10 segments, 10 compartments can be seen. And at the tip of the abdomen, you can see certain finger like projections. These are really, really important for identifying dragonflies and damselflies. Okay, these are called anal appendages. They are finger like projections and they are well developed only in the males. Okay, they, they are present in the females, but they are like rudimentary, they are not function. Okay, they function only in the males and its function, the only function of anal appendages is to grasp the female for mating. Prior to mating, the dragonflies and damselflies hold their mates, the females, uh, by their neck. So these finger-like projections help them to hold their females. Okay, so, so this, this uh, crucial uh, parts, these crucial parts play an important role in identifying species because most of the time what happens is that Mm, only uh, as, uh, the dra dragonfly, a male dragonfly belonging to the same species can hold the female by these anal appendages. So it's more, more or less like a lock and key mechanism. That is how hybridization is, uh, you know, that, that is uh, avoided in dragonflies and damselflies. Okay, so we'll see how uh, uh, we can tell apart a male from a female alternate. Okay, so I told you the anal appendages are well developed only in the males. Okay, so this is a male. Uh, and anal appendages are not well developed, they are just rudimentary in the females. And besides that, uh, the colors are more well developed, you know, the, it's, the males are usually more showy and colorful, the females are dull in color, they are cryptic. Why are the females cryptic? Like in most other species, the females are cryptic because they are not the ones who fight for the males. Okay, the males will have to display and fight for the female. The females, on the other hand, you know, they, it, it uh, lies cryptic and it has, uh, it, it usually doesn't fly like the male because it has a lot of eggs in its abdomen. That's why the abdomen is, uh, you know, broader. It's bigger than the uh, male. So it is comparatively uh, a poor flyer when I mean, you compare it with the male. So uh, there is no point in showing off the colors to the predators, right, when you can't fly away from them. So they remain, um, you know, hidden somewhere. They only come out for mating towards the water. So it's very hard to find the females of many species. Uh, many of the females are, are yet to be described. You know, only the males have been described. So that's another problem with dragonflies and damselflies. Okay. So uh, other than the colors, uh, I told you the anal appendages are different for the male and the female. And then if you uh, look at the segmented abdomen, uh, on the ventral side, in the second segment, second abdominal segment, you can see a small bulge. This is present only in the males, not in the females. Okay, this bulge is the copulatory organ. Okay, equivalent to your penis, this is the copulatory organ that is present in the second abdominal segment. But the testis in the male is present between the ninth and tenth abdominal segment. So that is a problem. And these are not connected internally. Okay, so this is unique to the order ordinata. Okay, the copulatory organ is present in the second abdominal segment of the male. And the testis that produces sperms is present in the 10th abdominal segment. So the problem is that it is not internally connected. So it has to be transferred externally. So that is why the uh, dragonfly, the male dragonfly will have to bend its abdomen and transfer the sperms from the 10th abdominal segment to the second abdominal segment prior to mating. So that is, uh, it differs from species to species. Some species do it after getting hold of the female. Some of them do it beforehand. Okay, so these are the differences between a male and a female. And if you take a closer look at the anal appendages, okay, this, uh, the, this is a uh, uh, anal appendage of a male dragonfly. It has two superior appendages and one inferior appendage. So a male dragonfly has a total of three anal appendages. Okay, uh, in the case of damselflies, there are uh, two superior anal appendages and two inferior anal appendages for the male. So a male damselfly has a total of four anal appendages. Okay, and if you come to the females, both in dragonflies and damselflies, uh, the anal appendages are much reduced and they don't have any inferior appendages. Only the superior appendages are present as stubs. So by looking at the tip of their abdomen, you can say which is the male, which is the female, uh, and also the dragonflies will have three, the, the males will have three anal appendages, male damselflies will have only, uh, will have four appendages. Okay, 
So uh, in the case of dams and flies, there is an extra feature. You can see something written as stylus here. Stylus is actually a sensory organ. It is a sense. It's a sense. It can sense touch. You know, it's a sense organ of touch. It can because that is needed because the damsel flies. You know, they lay their eggs in vegetation, which is submerged in water or some debris floating in water. That's where they lay their eggs. So for that, they need to test if that surface is uh, you know apt for them to lay their eggs. So this stylus is used, and behind stylus there is a spear-like organ called ovipositor, with which uh, the damsel fly, the female damsel fly, can injure the plant. You know, it can dig a hole and put its eggs inside. So that is that is something that is present only in damsel flies and a single dragonfly family. Okay, so. That is what I said. Biology is a science of exceptions. You cannot say that this uh, stylus and the uh, spear-like ovipositor is found only in damselflies, but it is also present in one dragonfly family. I'll tell you which one. Okay. So we'll take a deeper look at the gender differences that we see in dragonflies. Okay. So this is the male, the showy red one. This is the female of the common species called Crocothemis cervile or scarlet skimmer. Okay. Okay. Now we come to the scientific names. Now I'll have to tell you why I am depending on scientific names first. Okay. So uh, most of you might be bird watchers, or you could be interested in any uh, taxon. You know, maybe birds, maybe butterflies. Uh, in all of those, we use common names, right? Common English names, or maybe you have uh, them. Uh, you know, vernacular names in Kannada or Malayalam, whatever local language. But here uh, for Odonata, we usually. Uh, stick to scientific names because uh, species such as these, you know, many of these species, in fact, species such as the Crocothemis cervilia, this is a very common species found in our paddy fields, our wetlands, our ponds, uh, but it is not just found in India, it is found in Sri Lanka, it is found in other uh, East Asian nations, and every nation will have a different common name, common English name. So that is very confusing, and most of these common names will have to do with the colors. Okay, there will be scarlet skimmer, there will be red skimmer, there will be crimson marsh glider. So it gets a lot, it gets a lot of confusion. You know, it's very confusing. You can't deal with it. So that is why uh, it is better to stick to uh, the scientific names such as Crocothemis cervilia. You know, if you can, uh, you know, uh, learn the name like Tyrannosaurus rex from Jurassic Park, it won't be a great deal. It's much easier than uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, I believe, Crocothemis cervile. And we have only, it's not very, uh, ordinates show only moderate diversity. You know, compared to birds, we have uh, some 1,300 species of birds, right? But we have only some 500 species of uh, ordinata in India. So, uh, and uh, if you uh, confine your studies to a state, uh, maybe a few, uh, 100 or 200 species you'll get in your state. So it's not a great deal. You can just, uh, you know, learn them. As you see them, you can associate with it, you know, Crocothemis cervilia, that is easier. Okay, so, so much for the scientific name. So this is a male, this is a female. So, so is that done? No, I wish it was so easy, but it is not. You have something called the andromorph female, see? If you look at the anal appendages of this individual, uh, it is like that of a female, because it is, the anal appendages are not well developed. You, they, you know, the, only the superior anal appendages are present as small stubs. Okay, so what is wrong with this guy? With this girl, actually, because it, it is a female, actually, uh, but it has the colors of the male. So why is it, why is it so? That is because the dragonflies and damselflies, they are very aggressive organisms, okay, and they have very short life cycles. So, so all they can think about is eating and mating, okay, and then die. That's all. I mean, they, they survive as larvae for a few months, perhaps, and then, then fly around as adults for a few weeks, and then they die off. So all they, get, they have in their minds is to eat and mate. Okay, so most of the time, the uh, male dragonflies have nothing in their mind except for mating. So they, they keep harassing females. They, even, they won't even get enough time for foraging. So this is, uh, this is believed to be a mechanism to avoid male harassment, this andromorphism. You know, it's, it's a trick. Actually, it is fooling the male dra dragonfly because it, it's like showing that I'm, I'm a male, I'm not a female. We are not sure how much it does, it works for the uh, female, uh, but we do know that this is not a very rare phenomenon. And it is a genetically controlled trait. A female, a yellow female dam a dragonfly or damselfly uh, cannot just wish and turn into a red one. Okay, this is a genetically determined trait. Okay. Then we have a rare condition called gynandromorph. These gynandromorphs exist in various taxa, including birds, butterflies. You would have seen certain pictures, but it is very rare in Odonata. 
so what is gynandromorphism it is the existence of both male and female tissue in the same individual so if you see, look at this uh, species this is this individual this is the crocodemis cervelia same but one half of it is red at least the thorax one half is red and the other half and the complete abdomen head everything is female so why does it happen it is believed to be a genetic aberration it's like a disease because it is not advantageous to the organism it might affect its breeding it might not be able to find a mate and breed so this is a very rare phenomenon uh, in fact this was found last year in kerala i think this was the first record of gynandromorphism we published it last year this is the first record of gynandromorphism uh, from india in order needs okay now a little bit about their morphology so this is how the males hold the females you can see there is a difference in that too in dragonflies and damselflies in dragonflies uh, the female is held by the back of its head you see it's just behind the head that the male is holding it using its three appendages two superior appendages and one inferior appendage but in the damselflies uh, the male is holding the female by its prothorax prothorax is actually a part of thorax only it is just an extension see where the four legs are situated okay so that is where uh, the four finger like anal appendages hold the female drag uh, damsel fly here and you know this is uh, this is this might look very complicated but uh, rest assured you don't need to learn all this to identify 90% of the ornata seen in india okay they can be identified just like birds in fact i i am not very well trained in uh, entomology i am a bird watcher i have interested in i have interest in ecology and environmental science and i somewhere down the line i realized okay the ornates are the best organisms to study the changes in nature i'll tell you why that's why i chose organisms i that's why i chose ornata for my research uh, so when i started off i did not know all this okay i don't i did not know what this uh, these veins are what these segments what are their uh, you know their significance i didn't know all that but uh, you can learn it step by step and if it doesn't matter even if you don't learn because you can as i told you you can identify 90% of the uh, ornata seen in india without all these details but uh, but if you yeah you know if you are too keen and if you are very keen and if you want to proceed further it's good to learn uh, as i told you there is head and head most of the head is occupied by the eyes you know the eyes are compound eyes meaning uh, they have each compound eye of the ornate is made up of thousands and thousands some some uh, claims uh, that is uh, 30000 some studies say there are 30000 um, simple eyes in one compound eye of an ornate okay so you can imagine okay, you they have two such eyes and then they have three simple eyes in front of front of their face okay so their their vision is very keen very keen okay so it's very that is why it is very difficult to Uh, go and catch a dragonfly because it, it its vision is too keen and it has almost a 360 degree vision even if you go from behind it will notice okay so that is the, all about its uh, eyes and the wings are membranous wings and it is innervated you see the veins see these veins are used use uh, for uh, taxonomy also so each of these veins will have names if you look at uh, the entomology books but you don't need to learn all that but just uh, know that these uh, are veins okay and then there are these are important these are pterostigma these are wing spots okay these are present in almost all ornata they were not present in the earlier forms uh, but they are uh, they are here for uh, they are present for most of the uh, species that we uh, find now okay so this pterostigma they help in balancing it said that uh, the the function of the pterostigma or the wing spot is in balancing when it flies in the air okay so these are the 10 segments and then uh this is the ovipositor that i was talking about i told you that all of the damsel flies and dragon flies belonging to one family use this ovipositor to deposit the eggs uh, by injuring the plant material you know by digging holes that is how they lay eggs and you don't need to go into detail you know even the legs even as leg of a, a dragon fly will have these parts it will have names like coxart or chanda don't get intimidated by these terms it's not needed at least not for the moment okay so this is the complicated uh, mating procedure of the ornata okay so this is what happens even for the dragonflies and the damselflies it's the same so this is what happens this is the first step uh, the damselfly is holding the uh, female by its prothorax you know the anal appendages are used for that this is called the tandem position if you 
are in the habit of visiting wetlands for bird watching or for any other purpose you would have seen this you know they they even fly uh, to and fro in this position in the tandem position okay after this uh, female is ready for mating this is what the male does the male i told you it, it bends its abdomen and transfers the sperm from the 10th segment prior to mating and that is after only after that uh, mating can happen between the male and the female once the mating is done that is when only that is that is the mating wheel you know it is called the mating wheel it forms a heart like emoji <laughs> kind of shape you know that is why they form this uh, this is this shape cannot be found anywhere else in the animal kingdom i believe while mating okay so afterwards after mating is done the eggs are laid then and there okay so this mating usually happens near the water bodies okay so there are two kinds of oviposition this oviposition is nothing but egg laying there are two kinds of it happening okay there is endophytic oviposition that is uh, shown by most or i mean all damselflies and only one dragonfly family okay this endophytic means uh, i told you using that ovipositor they make small uh, injuries on the plant material or any floating debris and then they deposit their eggs there okay uh, for exophytic oviposition which is shown by almost all dragonflies except one family uh, they lay their eggs just uh, on the surface of water you know there's nothing else there is no injury or nothing made to the plants they just deposit their eggs on the surface of water or maybe on floating vegetation and then they, they just fly off and some of them uh, do that unguarded you know that is the male is not present so this female is doing it, it alone but sometimes this tandem position is attained again and then uh, the male forces the female to lay its eggs that's what happens most of the time and even the in endophytic position some, sometimes it is unguarded and other times it is guarded that is called tandem guarding so why is the male guarding the female even after mating okay that is very very interesting see uh, the i told you there is uh, the secondary genitalia i told you about the secondary genitalia that is the copulatory organ present in the second abdominal segment of the male it is a very special organ and you know uh, what happens is that another if, if even after mating if this male is uh, detaches and it flies off another male can come and catch hold of the same female damsel fly and using the secondary genitalia which is specialized it can scrape out the first damsel flies sperms okay so that is very disadvantageous for the first damsel fly okay to avoid that to avoid its sperms uh, getting scratched off by the second male it makes sure that the female lays eggs in its presence that is called tandem guarding that that is how the eggs are laid okay this is this tandem guarding behavior is shown by uh, usually by dragonflies and damselflies which are not territorial you know since they do not have a territory uh, the risk is high you know some other dragonfly or damselfly some other male may come off and uh, take off its female so uh, this this unguarded is usually shown by dragonflies and damselflies uh, which uh, protect their territories so that the males are sure that the second male will not come and take away its female okay so this is very interesting breeding behavior of ordinator tell you what this uh, there are two kinds of eggs okay so if uh, uh, an ordinate is uh, laying its egg endophytically as in like you know making some injury in plant material and depositing it inside it is usually of this shape you know elongated so that it can fit in nicely into the plant material and uh, when if it is uh, do, using this uh, endophytic type of oviposition it will have only some 300 to each clutch will have 300 to 400 eggs okay but if it is exophytic what happens is that it will it will be more in number there will be thousands of eggs 1000 to 2000 eggs it will lay this is high since it is not protected inside any plant material it is exposed to uh, elements of weather and other uh, organisms predation uh, more eggs are laid okay okay so once the eggs are laid uh, it will remain for a few days uh, either inside the plant material or in in the water body and then it hatches and the larva comes out the larva lives in water for a few weeks okay and uh, in between it molts multiple times okay so that's what happens uh, once the egg hatches eggs hatch you know the larvae come out uh, what comes out uh, straight out of the uh, egg is called the pro larva it will not have the features of such an insect it will be like a worm uh, after one or two molds it will attain the shape and uh, you know the features of the pro proper uh, aquatic organism uh, of a proper aquatic insect it is uh, known by various names it's usually referred to as larva 
sometimes it's called um, nymph but the actual term is naiad n a i a d uh, naiad but it's the one that is popularly used is larva okay so the larva molts multiple times within the water and for the final molt it comes out it just crawls out of the water okay so the larva is a very hardy organism it is not just uh, uh, for molting it comes out even if there is something wrong with the water quality or if uh, you know the dissolved oxygen content is low or the temperature is too high for it it, it can just come out of water it will just crawl, crawl out of water like a, an ordinary insect and it can hunt for uh, look for other water bodies to survive in okay so if that that doesn't happen uh, then uh, it will complete its life cycle you know the larval stages and then for the final molt it will come out and by the time it comes out it would have uh, formed its wings inside okay so you can see the wing pads here itself okay so the final instar you know the final stage larva will have well developed wing pads and for the this is the final molt that happens you know so so if people uh, uh, you know observing that, um, butterflies would have noticed one thing there is no cocooning or a pupal stage here okay so they just uh, molt molt and molt and then for the after the final molt the adult comes out so this is called the hemi metabolic development okay this is not complete metamorphosis so this is incomplete metamorphosis that occurs in automata okay so that is the main difference uh, between uh, these groups of insects so this these are the various pictures you know various stages showing how this is a technically called eclosion eclosion e c l o s i o n eclosion but this is you can say this is emergence this is the emergence of the adult from the final stage larva okay so this is what happens so and the final uh, you know the, the imago this is called the imago that comes out of the uh, for final instar larva and it, this is called a tenaril because it is very delicate you know by the time it comes out it will be very delicate it is very prone to predation it is very vulnerable uh the wings are very soft you cannot uh, go and catch it uh, right away because it will just crumble okay so it will be ghost like the colors are not well formed so this usually happens at night or early mornings okay so that it can avoid being eaten by predators such as spiders and birds you know because the wings this uh, organism will not be able to fly right away it will have to dry up you know this is very wet and you know very clumsy uh, during this stage when it has emerged from the larva so it will wait for some time it will dry itself uh, in the sun and only then it can fly so this usually happens at night or early mornings okay so this metamorphosis what is the significance of metamorphosis it is a very successful strategy almost 65% of all animals on earth show this not just ordinata many organisms show this metamorphosis because the young ones and the adult individuals can coexist you know uh, if you take a species uh, some of them may be present let's say there is coromandel marsh dart some of it may be present as larvae in water the others are present as adults flying around so there for each habitat uh, there is more number of individuals okay some some can exist in water the others can exist in uh, in the air or uh, terrestrially so this is a strategy for that okay so this is a very successful strategy and this originated some 300 million years ago this strategy of metamorphosis okay and uh, ordinata is one of the first groups to show this metamorphosis okay so this is a tenaril you know so this is the very special thing about uh, ordinata you know they connect these three worlds okay if you talk about amphibians they live in water for some time and then they come out but they do not fly right very few organisms cl can claim this okay these organisms the ordinata they connect water land and air because they deposit their eggs in water their larvae require water for their uh, foraging and survival afterwards they uh, climb out for climbing out uh, and for some uh, hours at least they need uh, terrestrial space and even afterwards they use terrestrial uh, resources and then they use air okay so if anything for flying for flying they need air so if anything goes wrong in any of these habitats either in water land or air it gets reflected in their diversity and population okay so that is why they are ideal they are ideal for what they are ideal for indicating the changes in nature in the ecosystem that is why they are known as indicator species okay so now let's look at their evolution uh, the first dragonflies came uh, on the face of the earth some 300 million years ago and imagine the humans are only 
around two lakh uh, years of age. You know, the the we uh, Homo sapiens came into existence somewhere in the Pleistocene. Okay, and these guys, uh, the dragonflies, came around a uh, Carboniferous period that is like three fifty million years ago. So this is a very very interesting quote. They have witnessed the appearance and disappearance of dinosaurs. Dinosaurs and other organisms have come and gone. Massive mass extinctions have taken place, but the ordinates have survived. Okay, but it is yet to be seen if they can survive us. Okay, that is one thing. And then look at the size of the earliest dragonflies. Okay, so it's it's about the size of a large hawk or eagle, right? Okay, so there is a reason why it is so big. That is because the Earth had 29 percent oxygen on its atmosphere. Now it is close to 20, 20 to 21 percent. Okay, so the uh, more oxygen was available, so the organisms, especially the insects, could grow very large. Okay, so that's why they were very large. And towards the end of their peak, you know, in the Jurassic period, other organisms evolved, like the Archaeopteryx, which was the ancestor of birds. So there was predation pressure also. These birds or the ancient birds preyed on the ancestors of Ordinata. So there was this selection pressure for them to become smaller. So that's why, uh, because of these two reasons, because of the reduction of oxygen in the atmosphere and the predation pressure, they became small and became what we see today. And when you talk about their uh, behavior, they are predators. I told you, I'll deal with it later how they eat and all. Uh, then they are territorial, I told you. Because for uh, they hold a territory for mating and feeding that is there, and then they patrol. You know there there are dragonflies that patrol large bodies of water. You would have seen this. So if you see a dragonfly fly, uh, flying just to and fro, you know without stopping, it's not just for fun that it's flying. It's actually patrolling its territory. Okay, so uh, based on their flight, they can be classified into perchers and flyers. You know most dragonflies are perchers. Perchers means they perch. You know they they perch at some point and then they, they, they have this affinity to come towards that point again and again. So it is very easy to photograph and study such um, ordinates. You know, even if you have a uh, mobile camera with a, maybe with a macro lens, you can get very good photographs and you can document them. Because even if the, it flies away, it will come to the same position. Okay, so that is perchers, but then a few of them are flyers like this. Most big dragonflies are flyers. They keep flying, okay? In their active hours, they keep flying and only for resting they, after hours of flying, they roost. They come and perch somewhere. Okay. Then, then they are, uh, they have to thermoregulate. They are cold-blooded animals, you know, not like us. So their body temperature, you know, it, it, it falls and, you know, uh, according to the uh, temperature in the environment. For, so for that, they have uh, mechanisms like basking, which is done by most snakes, uh, reptiles, you know, frogs do that, even butterflies do that. So even dragonflies do it because they need to raise their body temperatures for flight for that they bask. You know, the flyers have another mechanism. They keep flying so that their muscle movement, uh, you know, it, it develops heat. The musculature that develops heat, that is enough for them. But the others, the perchers will have to bask in the sun. Okay. Then there is something called obelisk posture. Okay, what is obelisk posture? This is this is the obelisk posture. Okay, it what it means is that uh, this is a mechanism by which it reduces its exposure to sun. You know, when it is very hot, you know, it does need sun for it to be active, but uh, too much of sun is also a problem. You know, it will get burned up. So to avoid that, it just reduces uh, the exposure to sun. You know, the surface area that is exposed to the sun is minimized by this posture. So this is called the Obelisk posture. This usually happens when the sun is right in the uh, on top of his head, so that its surface area is reduced, the exposure is de reduced, and then they congregate. Many of the dragonflies and damselflies, especially the ones which travel a lot, they congregate. I'll tell you about their travels, and then they they congregate and roost communally. Okay. And then this is this is I, I would be bursting uh, <laughs> some bubbles. You know, people have this idea that. Uh, Dragonflies and damselflies, they are usually seen in gardens and near flowers. So they, they have this wrong impression that they feed on nectar. No, they don't. They're not poor creatures like uh, butterflies or moths. They are voracious predators. They feed on other insects and almost anything they can overcome. Okay, so here you have this cute damselfly <laughs> biting off the head of a moth. Okay, and here they also feed on pests, several insect pests. So they play a very important role in, contact, uh, in you know, controlling the insect pest 
insect population in our paddy fields and other agricultural areas. They are even cannibalistic. You see, they can eat their own kind. So this is a green marsh hawk eating another green marsh hawk. Wow, that doesn't usually happen in animal world. No, that is a rare phenomenon. It might happen in certain organisms like snakes, uh, but it's, uh, it's rare, it's rare, but it happens in order needs. They eat almost anything they can overcome. Okay, including this. You, you know, when I first came across this uh, picture uh, uh, in the internet, uh, a few years back, I thought it was fake. But then I uh, referred and it is not fake. This is a, this is a um, dragonfly known as dragon hunter. It is hunting down a ruby-throated hummingbird. Can you imagine a dragonfly eating a bird? Okay, so dragonflies are very powerful organisms. They will kill and eat almost anything they can overcome. This happened in Canada. You can refer this. Later on. And uh, they are not just predators, but they are also prey. You know, they are also prey for a host of organisms. There are parasitoids, like in butterflies, there are parasitoids that uh, you parasitize their eggs. Then there are water mites. You know, these mites that, that cling on to them. So th this is very interesting. So uh, in the case of dragonflies and damselflies, they lay their eggs in water. No, their larvae survive in water and the adults fly. Right. But uh, in the case of uh, these water mites that are parasitic on ordinates, the larvae are parasitic on the adults and the adults are free living in water. <laughs> so when the dragonfly deposits uh, its eggs in water, the adults, you know, the adult water mites lay their eggs on the larvae of the dragonfly. Okay, and when the dragon and, and when the larva of the dragonfly emerges, uh, the male is, I mean, the adult is infected with these water mites. So this is very common. You can see this in wetlands, but we don't know why certain species are more affected than the others. Okay, but these are very common water mites. And then there are predators uh, like the birds, the uh, you know frogs, you know these green beaters. Even though they are named beaters, you most of most of the time you see them eating dragonflies. So they are the prime predators of dragonflies, spiders, and even insectivorous plants like Drosera, Prion, dragonflies. So they play a very important role in the food chain and food web of our ecosystems. And when you talk about their diversity, there are some 6,300 species. And in India, we have uh, close to 500 species and it keeps increasing day by day because we are discovering newer and newer species every year. Even this year, we, till now we have, we have some uh, three or four species discoveries happening. So what this means is that we need to uh, look deeper, right? We have not even documented all the uh, ordinator uh, inhabiting our ecosystems. Even before that, many might be going extinct. So this, uh, this is a taxonomic challenge, okay? Even the Western Gates has 193 species. The state of Kerala has 174 species till date. We are sure it will be around 200 by the next uh, four to five years because new species are getting at least uh, the range extensions are being recorded and even new species are being discovered. Okay, so now let's get to something interesting. You, all of you would have heard about migrating um, butterflies and migrating birds mostly, but have you heard of migrating dragonflies? This is a species called Pantala flavescens. It is known by various common names like globe skimmer, globe wanderer, wandering glider. It is called so because it is found everywhere, all around the globe, except in the very cold places like uh, the Europe, the Northern Europe and the Antarctica. They are found everywhere and they share the common gene pool, which means these are all interbreeding individuals. They are all migrating and they are all interbreeding. That is what this means. That is why they share a common gene pool. Okay, they have this gliding behavior and uh, one of these migratory circuits was explored and it came into light in 2012 by a study by a scientist called Charles Anderson. Okay, what he found was that they, these uh, organisms, these insects use the southwest monsoon, okay, to travel from, there are winds, seasonal winds, they are called southwest monsoon winds, okay, they are called, they are also called trade winds, they use it for, to travel from Africa to India. So they reach the North India by June to July. At that period and then they use the northeast monsoon winds to reach the southern states like Kerala and Tamil Nadu. Uh, they are found in thousands now at this time by October they reach here and then uh, by the same using the same wind they reach the African coast. So this is a migratory circuit and it is not the same individuals that travels you know uh, these uh, there are at least four generations that are completed in this migratory circuit. 
that is because this species has one of the shortest life spans as a larva okay because within 6 weeks the larva is matured and it uh, pops out into an adult okay so that is very interesting so so only a few uh, weeks are required for it to develop and only few rains are enough you know the, the puddles that are formed you know the puddles of water that are formed immediately after monsoons even in the roadside is enough for this species to develop okay to breed and develop into adults so this is the migratory circuit that was identified and we in kerala we have a group called society for ordnance studies okay so this is formed exclusively for the study of dragonflies and damselflies and we have started a, a citizen science project to monitor the uh, migration you know just to know when they are coming to india when they are leaving in what uh, weather conditions are they leaving where are they breeding to answer such questions we have uh, launched a program called the pan pandala track you are all welcome to participate in it you know you just need to search for this pan pandala track in uh, this uh, telegram okay so we have a group and then any citizen science anyone interested in dragonflies can join and help us knowing more about them okay so now we'll just see uh, the dragonflies um, and damselflies according to their habitats in which they are seen okay so let's begin with the worst kind of habitat that one can imagine okay these are open drains and eutrophic water bodies you know polluted water bodies uh, you know they they cannot survive without water that is one thing you know even if you find your uh, dragonfly or damselfly in your garden Uh, it doesn't mean that it can live uh, there for long it has to go in search of water for reproduce okay so but this is the worst kind of water one can think of you see there there is all kind of debris floating around it is highly polluted but even in such places dragonflies and damselflies they have adapted to survive one such damselfly is the senegal golden darklet as the name implies it it is found uh, in from right from uh, senegal in africa to almost all asian countries Okay, this is the Senegal golden darklet. Okay, there is another thing that I want to add here. This is the male. Okay, this is the male damselfly. This is the female, but this is also the female. Okay, so so this is the immature female. There is another complication. Uh, in many of the uh, ordinata, especially damselflies, uh, the females mature very slowly, and uh, when they mature, they have different color morphs. the males are uh, very early to mature you know within a few weeks they mature uh, as they after they hatch out from larva within a few weeks they mature and they uh, go and uh, form their own territories but females take longer to mature and there are uh, there could be several color morphs okay so this is one complication that you must keep in mind okay this is the same species but different color morphs okay so this is an, uh, this is the dragonfly known as ditch jewel okay look at its scientific name it is known as brachytemis contaminata what an unfortunate animal contaminata it has uh, it, it implies that it breeds in contaminated waters okay which is not true it, it really does not need contaminated waters but it does really well exceptionally well in contaminated waters because no other dragonfly can survive here okay since there is no other dragonfly that can survive here this guy is very successful here so you can see them in large numbers they breed very well in polluted waters because there is no competition from other dragonflies so we can say that it is an indicator of pollution it is no fault of this insect okay it's no fault of this dragonfly it is our fault that the water bodies are getting polluted this species has just adapted itself to survive in such habitats okay then even in human dwellings these uh, organisms these uh, dragonflies have adapted to survive I take the case of this granite ghost okay this is just uh, near my home in my neighborhood uh, so these are uh, this open tanks you know fresh water tanks these are disused they are not in use anymore i just thought of climbing uh, to on top of this uh, building and just peeping in you know just to see what is inside i i expected to find a lot of uh, mosquito larvae because water gets collected no what rain water gets collected i expected to see a lot of uh, mosquito larvae so if that is the case i'll have to do something because uh you know it will spread diseases that is why i checked in but all i could find were this the larvae of this ordinata okay this dragonfly these are the larvae so there is a reason why no mosquito larvae are found here because this larvae the larvae of bradenopyga geminata the granite ghost is known to prey almost exclusively on mosquito larvae they are voracious predators of mosquito larvae even this species has been used uh, in japan and other countries for control of uh, mosquitoes i don't know why it's not been tried in india 
but they are not uh, that one could be one reason could be that they are not exclusive uh, predators of mosquito larvae because they eat almost anything they can find okay anything but uh, usually in these tanks there is nothing else except for the mosquito larvae so uh, it is it is the dragonflies and damselflies uh, that protect us actually from these mosquitoes because they help in controlling their population very much okay then there are open wells near our you know there are dragonflies which survive here one of the this is this uh, particular dragonfly called pygmy skimmer is called kinarthumbi in malayalam the name uh, means it is a an well dweller you know it it you know it makes use of wells as a habitat there is a breeding behavior its breeding behavior is very interesting because the female deposits its eggs not in water but on such branches you know hanging here you know some vegetation here and when it rains the eggs get washed away into the water and that is when it hatches that is when the eggs hatch and the larvae survive in water okay even so in the, even in this water you are safe from mosquitoes okay they will not let them breed at least not not in very high numbers so then there is this uh, brown dusk hawk okay cyxoma petiolatum this species uh, as its name implies the brown dusk hawk you see it is it is dusk hawk which means it is active in the uh, evening it is an evening dragonfly it flies during the evenings in the mornings they will rest inside the somewhere in this crevices somewhere and and uh, towards the evening they keep flying and in the evenings their main prey comprise of adult mosquitoes so even as adults uh, the dragonflies help in controlling mosquitoes and uh, there is one more thing that i want to add uh, there is something called pruinescence okay this is not the actual color of this dragonfly it is called brown dusk hawk no so the dragonfly is actually brown in color and there are some markings but all those colors and markings are obscured by this waxy coating that develops in very old individuals of dragonflies especially the males this uh, coating waxy coating is called pruinescence okay and we you we call this uh, individual as pruinosed individual so this is a very tricky situation because uh, when such markings and colors are not visible it is sometimes difficult to identify the species okay and then there are paddy fields you know the our paddy fields are excellent habitats you know some of these dragonflies and damselflies have exploited the paddy fields as their breeding habitats and there they serve a very important function of pest control you see this damselfly is preying on a pest and i am sure many of you would be familiar with this uh, dragonfly particular dragonfly called the common picture it is also found abundantly in our paddy fields then we come to ponds you know uh, there are dragonflies in ponds but not if you clear if you clear up all this vegetation there will be nothing you know that is unfortunately that is what is happening in the name of reviving ponds in most of our towns and cities all this vegetation get removed you know the municipality the corporation workers come and remove all this vegetation but what happens what happens then the damselflies will not be able to lay their eggs because they need vegetation to deposit their eggs and even the dragonfly larvae require vegetation to hide you know they 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 are not just predators they are also prey they need to hide from their prey and they need to uh, they need to hide from their predators and they need to stalk their prey for that also they need a vegetation so if you re remove all this vegetation it becomes like a swimming pool you know it like it becomes a swimming pool and that is all it is worth you know you can just swim swim around it is not ecologically it becomes dead okay so these are some of the species that are uh, seen in such ponds you know this is the python sarora the the crimson marsh glider so this is one of the most beautiful dragonflies that you can come across uh, i thought initially i thought this was a very uh, rare dragonfly you know i've never seen this i had never seen this i thought when i started observing dragonflies i thought this this should be a very uh, rare dragonfly because i have never seen uh, this dragonfly anywhere but once i started observing them i realized this is a very common species you can see it in any pond or any wetland okay so this is the crimson marsh glider and then this is an exception okay this damselfly is an exception to damselflies why because i told you most of the damselflies rest with their wings closed you know and held parallel to their abdomen but in this case at in this uh, whole family called lestidae this family of damselflies they keep their wings open while resting so this is the sapphire red spread wings okay so these damselflies are called spread wings because uh, unlike other damselflies they keep their wings open while resting then you have large water bodies such as lakes where you can see large dragonflies also you see this is the uh, blue darner called anax immaculifrons it belongs to the family aeschnidae 
this family is important because this is the dragonfly family that i was talking about this is the only dragonfly family in which the females have an ovipositor and the females lay their eggs in vegetation you know they they, they make small uh, holes in the vegetation protecting debris anything and then they deposit their eggs so so this is the only dragonfly family that exhibits uh, what is known as um, endophytic oviposition okay so this is uh, the very common common club tail you know this is this looks like a tiger so uh, in malayalam we have a, a common name called natukaduva which, which is like uh, the common tiger it's that is what it is it means okay you can see it is biting the head of a wasp so you, you can understand you know the wasp sting but the, you know you can understand how a voracious predator this one is okay so usually uh, the dragonflies and damselflies cannot survive in uh, saline water okay uh, none of the dragonflies can survive in seas or oceans but some of them a few of them can survive in coastal lagoons and estuaries you know these are some of the species the coastal glider and the brown dartlet they are not very common uh, most of the dragonfly larvae are intolerant of high salinity but these uh, dragonflies and damselflies their larvae can tolerate uh, some salinity and hence they can survive in lagoons and estuaries then you have streams okay even in large and very wide uh, uh, you know large water bodies such as big rivers uh, the ordinates could be rare okay that is because why are they rare because uh, they cannot uh, you know the larvae they cannot withstand the high pressure of the water column and also there are a lot of predators like the fish and other organisms in uh, deep water bodies so yes, in such water bodies they try to exist in the along the uh, edges what you call littoral zone you know so these are the common species uh, found in such streams uh, even people who are not interested in dragonflies will have this uh, would have seen this uh, species the stream ruby you know Uh, this is an essential photograph of every nature lover okay then you have the common torrent hawk a very large dragonfly that you found, find in streams and then there are dragonflies which survive in waterfalls even okay so these are extreme conditions these are extreme conditions even the larvae can withstand the high pressure okay of the waterfalls they can survive there then there are shaded brooks now if you see we are coming from the most polluted to the most pristine environments okay so we started from the drains and open uh, you know polluted water bodies now we are slowly coming to the shaded brooks and streams of pristine forests and in such places you can see uh, alternates such as these endemic ones you know these are uh, uh, dragonflies which do not fly away to uh, they do not disperse very well you know they are confined to these habitats because of their long abdomen and small wings okay they cannot disperse you, they do not fly to a great distance though so they'll be they'll emerge from this water body and will always be found somewhere near this water body so uh, they are very highly species diverse this group because you know each uh, hill and each forest will have its own species so we have close to 12 species of uh, protocicta the reed tails in western ghats then there are marshes in which there are species seen some uh, typical species seen okay this is the white dartlet usually uh, a common resident of such marshes and the blue tailed yellow skimmer that's a dragonfly and then you have the phytotelmata that is a tree trunk cavity you know this is a very specific micro habitat it is found nowhere else it can breed nowhere else it cannot be breed in a pond it cannot breed in a lake it cannot breed in a river this is the very specific micro habitat that this dragonfly requires you know Uh, these are uh, these holes in tree trunks where the water gets collected this these kind of habitats exist only in tropical forests like in western ghats or maybe northeast india so these species are very spe habitat specific and they are found only there so right from the brachytherium is contaminata which can breed in most polluted waters we have, we have come to the lyriotherium is tricolor or the tricolor blood tail which requires this exclusive habitat you know this exquisite habitat for breeding okay so do we need to conserve them okay uh, throughout my talk i kept talking about uh, you know about dragonflies how they are important to us because they feed on mosquitoes they feed on pests uh, so both as larvae and adults they control pest populations and uh, they reflect their changes in the environment very well because they survive in water they need uh, land resources also and also their uh, species diversity is moderate you know there are the, if there were like 10000 species of ordinates it will be very difficult to study them 
okay but it, since it shows only moderate diversity since there are only around 500 species of ordinates in india it is very easy to learn them so they are important bio indicators okay so this species in particular this euphia fraser it is a resident of the western ghats the forest streams okay so it cannot tolerate uh, a change in its uh, environment either uh, it is uh, deforestation even if it is uh, if some pollution in its water or a change in temperature of its water it cannot tolerate so if you see this species somewhere you can see you know without even without uh, doing any other studies including the studies of water quality you can say that the water is pristine and the habitat is good okay so they are important indicators species okay so uh, we have done certain studies i told you we have this group uh, for exclusive study of ordinata in kerala and we you do these studies regularly this these surveys where, where people participate ordinata enthusiasts participate and then you we uh, submit these reports to the forest department and then we have been able to do this we have been able to successfully lobby uh, you know we have successfully lobbied and we have brought this buffer zone of silent valley you would have heard of silent valley this is one of the few remaining patches of rainforest in the western ghats okay so this this silent valley there is a buffer zone this buffer zone is about to be declared as a wildlife sanctuary thanks to such studies so anyone can participate because such studies are required because there are a host of threats to the dragonflies you know you're not studying i told you new as even as newer species are being described their habitats are getting destroyed in many many ways you know the many species cannot survive in forests they require water bodies and uh, you know wetlands uh, wetlands are one of the most threatened ecosystems uh, in the world today you know because we need land right we need land for development so the wetlands are getting filled up that's what's happening here and then the herbicides and pesticides are used without any sense you see this this is the effect of spraying herbicides without any care for the environment so the vegetation dies along with it all the organisms die off so these are the problems that we face and for the conservation of, of ordinata like uh, for the conservation of most species this is what we need to do we need to conserve the remaining ponds marshes and other freshwater bodies including forests and we can also do this habitat enhancement you can actually dig new ponds okay maybe not all species can survive there but there are a few species that would come and you know uh, colonize such habitats so we can actually think about making um, such ponds ordinata ponds in schools and colleges because they need not be deep they can be shallow water bodies just like you make uh, butterfly gardens you can think of making dragonfly ponds and these are just want to list some of the um, common uh, few resources okay for this this is mostly restricted to kerala our activities are mostly restricted to kerala but uh, this this uh, book is freely available it's pdf version the dragonflies of kerala by dr subramanian of uh, zoological survey of india this this is a this is a very good book for beginners and it is freely available uh, on the internet dragonflies of india okay and then you can also check out these facebook pages and online this indianordinator.org has a lot of uh, photos of dragonflies of most species many species you can it's a good repository of photographs then you have you have your uh, our uh, ordinate society website ordinate society.org so please keep in touch everyone uh, so i'm concluding my talk here and i thank all the photo contributors and uh, after this today's talk even if one of you one out of this 40 43 participants is gets interested in dragonflies uh, i would consider this as a grand success thank you uh, so there is one interesting question uh, from Anu. Uh, she is asking okay. how the next generations of ordinates will know where to migrate. Do they have any such memories? Okay, so what we think is that it is genetically controlled, and uh, you know they 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 do not. Uh, and uh, one thing one we should keep in mind is that it is not active migration as happens for the um, birds. You know, the birds are active migrants because they use their own energy to travel. Uh, the dragonflies are passive migrants as i told you they make use of the winds for traveling so i think it is uh, the there is some genetic imprinting happening and also they take environmental cues and they just when you know uh, there is there is, this wind comes they just they just enter the wind okay the front uh, the wind and then they just travel that's all that's what they do the wind does the job not the dragonflies okay thank you uh, thank you so much vivek uh, for giving us your valuable time and uh, sharing your experience of working with the helicopters of the ecosystem unveiling their uh, lives so it was wonderful listening to you 
and we, it was a very interest uh, interactive session uh, thank you thanks a lot